Could you talk about where we are right now in this conflict? Because I think many people are looking at this and saying, wow, the escalation ladder is being climbed and, 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 and it's climbing quite quickly. Well, it is. I mean, it's a very dangerous. I, I personally believe that the, um, the world hasn't faced a crisis, a nuclear crisis of this um, scope and scale since the Cold War or, or even never. Uh, I'll give you an example. 1962, October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, first of all, the the missile crisis was slow rolling. Um, it, 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 it didn't happen instantaneously. Indeed, uh, the big event we were worried about is as Soviet ships were heading to Cuba, uh, there was a naval blockade put in place, and then the, we were watching the ships coming in uh, to see what would happen when the two uh, hit. And um, while that was happening, though, the leaders of both countries were making phone calls. They were talking to each other. Imagine that diplomacy. Um, there was a Russian ambassador, Soviet ambassador uh, in Washington, D.C., who was not only meeting with the government officially, but working a back channel to the Kennedy um, White House. Uh, and there were similar lines of communication being opened up with uh, Nikita Khrushchev in the Soviet Union. There was dialogue taking place. And as a result, they were able to manage this crisis and avoid a uh, decisive confrontation, avoid a war. And a lot of people say that's the closest we came to a nuclear conflict. Um, well, today we have a situation where there, there is no slow moving convoy heading to each other. We basically have given the Ukrainians permission to fire uh, long range precision guided American made munitions into Russia um, ostensibly to strike places in Russia that are being used to attack Ukraine. Um, there, there, there's a couple flaws in this in this uh, thinking on the part of the West. First is the notion of we can't let Russia have a safe haven. You see, if Russia is going to launch attacks from inside Russian territory against Ukraine, then Ukraine must have the ability to strike back into Russia. Um, I say, well, if that's the case, then... What about the safe haven that Ukraine has today in Europe, in NATO? You know, the one where they have uh, airplanes, uh, they have pilots being trained on F-16s in Belgium and elsewhere. Um, in any war situation, those would be legitimate targets and should be struck. What about the tank repair facilities that exist in Poland, in Germany, uh, in the Baltic nations? If you take a piece of a combat equipment off the battlefield and are repairing it to send it back to the battlefield, that becomes a legitimate target of war, the repair facility. What about the warehouses where weapons that are being sent to Ukraine are being stored in advance? Those are legitimate uh, targets. The lines of communication, the free flow of material and manpower. You know, it's it's basically the NATO version of uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail going back to Vietnam. Uh, that North Vietnam ran out of, you know, out of North Vietnam, the down Laos and into Cambodia along the um, western border of South Vietnam, um, where they would just move their logistics. And the United States was frustrated because they're saying, <laughs> we can't fight them in South Vietnam and all this material is coming in. So we began to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We began to launch commando attacks. We invaded uh, South or we invaded Cambodia to run a, a war to prevent this safe haven from happening. We know what it means to have a safe haven, and we know what it means, but what we have to do in response. We know what we did, and yet we're telling the Russians, oh, you can't attack NATO because of Article 5. Oh, attack against one, attack against all. So we are creating this safe haven. We know that it's, it, it's it, by employing this safe haven the way we do that we are becoming parties to the conflicts, but we won't admit that. And then we have the hypocrisy of telling the Russians, but you can't have a safe haven. The Russia has reminded everybody over and over again that this isn't a war. This is a special military operation. Um, if you want to make it a war, then that's a, something totally different. But this is a special military operation. Now, Ukraine is firing these missiles. What, what makes these missiles being fired from Ukrainian soil particularly um, sensitive to the Russians? We go back to the Soviet Union times when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Um, and then you had a Warsaw Pact of Eastern Bloc nations. 
uh, Western missiles were actually pushed way, way, way to the West, and they were deployed in West Germany and the Netherlands and Italy and the United Kingdom. Um, but it took a while when those missiles launched to get to Russia. Um, it gives Russia some time to assess, is this a real launch? What's really going on? Was it a mistake? Do we need to immediately retaliate? There was a buffer built in there, sort of reminiscent of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Time to consider actions. Um, you know, one of the great dangers of the um, of, of the later stage of the Cold War in the 1980s is when we deployed the Pershing II missile into West Germany because the Pershing II was a solid rocket missile um, with very fast flying, and, and suddenly instead of having 20 to 30 minutes to talk things over, you had five to seven minutes when that thing was launched before it hit the Kremlin, which means there's no time to talk. That's why I always tell people. You know, when you meet a former weapons inspector who implemented the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, buy them a beer, shake their hand, and thank them for keeping you alive. Because by implementing the INF Treaty, we saved the world. There would have been a nuclear war. There's no doubt in my mind there would have been a nuclear war, one that killed everybody, because these weapons were so destabilizing. Um, but we got rid of them, and that was a good thing. The Russians when they built their command and control for their nuclear uh, war fighting capability, uh, their early warning radars, um, some of their advanced missile locations did so under the assumption that you had this buffer, Eastern European buffer, the you know, Belarus and Ukraine, and then you come into Russia proper, Central Russia. Now with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, those Eastern nations went away, uh, they now become part of NATO. NATO moves up and Russians are going, hey, you're getting a little close. We don't like this. Don't get so close. But we kept coming. And now we want to take Ukraine away. And if you take Ukraine away, it's like a giant ice cream scoop just scooping out the center of Russia's um, land buffer. And um, now if that becomes NATO and NATO puts missiles in there, you literally have missiles that are gonna, that un enable Ukraine as part of NATO to launch a first strike against Russian command and control, nuclear command and control, early warning radars, uh, missile launch facilities, national command. And the Russians went, that that will never happen. <laughs> You're never going to be allowed to do this, ever. That's why William Burns in 2008 wrote that memorandum. Net means net, no means no. And he said, this is the Russians mean this. If we seek to, we being the United States, seek to bring uh, Ukraine into NATO, William Burns wrote in early uh, 2008, um, there will be a civil war in Ukraine. What do you think the Maidan coup was? What do you think the Donbass? It's a civil war where ethnic Russians rose up against Ukrainian nationalists. A civil war, a conflict that will lead to Russian military intervention that will result in Ukraine at a minimum losing Crimea and the Donbass. Well, what did Ukraine lose? Crimea, the Donbass, oh yeah, and Kherson and Zaporizhia. Um, this was a predictable outcome. We knew exactly what, what, what would happen, but we did it anyways, because a lot of people believe that the Russians are bluffing, that the Russians are weak, that the Russians won't follow through. You know, Ray McGovern, um, who I believe is also a friend of your show, um, you know, former CIA analyst, a very, very smart man, talked about how in December of 2021, when the Russians put in their uh, draft treaties to resolve this conflict peacefully. One of their big concerns was uh, American missiles or NATO missiles ending up in, in Ukraine, threatening Moscow and these command centers. And indeed, there was a period of time where the uh, Russian uh, negotiators and American negotiators met in, uh, I believe it was Geneva, Switzerland, where they talked about this. And um, at first, the Americans promised, uh, I think Joe Biden promised, um, um, Vladimir Putin, oh, we'll never put missiles in Ukraine. We'll never, we, we have no intention of doing that whatsoever. Putin's like, good, that makes things very easy because if we can get this in guaranteed in a treaty form, you know, we maybe can ease up on some of our other conditions. Our big concern are the missiles. And Biden's like, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. But then when the negotiators met with the Russians, suddenly they weren't talking about missiles. The Russian goes, hey, hey, we want to, we want to nail down this missile thing. And they're going, eh, no, we, uh, we, that's too restrictive on NATO. We can't do that. We can't impose. We want to have the, that there's no missiles, but you know we we can't 
impose that up front because that makes us look like we're yielding to your demands. And of course, we can't be seen as yielding to the demands of Russia, no matter how reasonable they are. Um, and the Russians all the time are going, wait a minute, <laughs> Biden said no missiles. You're saying you can't. So the Russians knew from day one that the Americans were going to be bringing in these missiles uh, into, into Ukraine and they used them to attack. And so what Russia has done is say as forcefully as possible that this is an unacceptable um, expansion of the conflict, one that um, represents a existential threat to the survival of the Russian state. It's non-nuclear, but nonetheless, missiles fired that take out nuclear command and control, take out um, early warning radars, etc., becomes a existential. And don't believe Scott Ritter. All those people are, Scott Ritter doesn't know what he's talking about. He's an idiot. Well, maybe, but um, maybe not. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, but, you know, talk to the United States. Read America's nuclear doctrine, where we speak about cyber attacks. And one of the interesting things about the verbiage we use to describe cyber attacks and the consequences, we say that if there's a cyber attack, a cyber attack, that threatens to shut down national ban and control communications, the ability of the president to communicate with his nuclear command people, with his early warning systems, with the weapon systems himself. If there's a cyber attack that does this, then the United States is allowed to assume that it's the precursor of a larger attack, and then we can preemptively strike any, any threat that we've we've deemed. So you hit us with a cyber attack that threatens our nuclear infrastructure, and we're allowed to assume that it's an attack on our nuclear infrastructure designed to de, you know, uh, to, to take it out. And so we will preempt that by using our nuclear infrastructure to take out the source of the cyber attack. Um, well, gosh, if we can do that for a cyber attack, aren't the Russians allowed to do that when actual missiles strike? when ATACMS missiles or HIMARS missiles are used to strike these targets in Russia that represent part of their new, and it's not theoretical, ladies and gentlemen, at least two, two Russian early warning radar sites that are, have nothing to do with the war in Ukraine and everything to do with Russia's ability to detect um, you know, new, uh, new missile launches that could have a nuclear dimension to them. So we've already allowed Ukraine to attack Russia's nuclear infrastructure. We've allowed Ukraine to launch an attack against Ingalls Air Base, where they destroyed some strategic bombers. Again, one of the key aspects of Russia's nuclear doctrine is if you attack our nuclear infrastructure, including the weapon systems used to deliver nuclear weapons, even if you attack them in a non-nuclear manner, we will be allowed to respond uh, as if we were being struck with nuclear weapons. So Ukraine has attacked Russia's nuclear bomber fields in Ingalls. They've attacked two, uh, at least two, um, nuclear-related early warning uh, systems. And now they have missiles that can attack command and control and actual um, you know, nuclear-capable uh, missile uh, sites. Uh, what is Russia supposed to do? Nothing? Stand back and do nothing? And so I have been saying that we are one attack of missile um, attack uh, away from a nuclear conflict, that all it takes is the Ukrainians um, to fire one missile that hits the wrong target on the wrong day with the wrong people in it. And we're going, we're going, we're going nuclear. Um, and that's just a statement of fact. Now, what has Vladimir Putin done? Now, in the lead up to the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, um, the Russians were saying things, uh, not necessarily Putin, but uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who sort of is the bad cop to Putin's good cop, and, and others, including uh, very influential uh, political and military commentators on Russian media, uh, were saying that, you know, Russia, if, if the West does this, if, uh, if the Germans use their, um, the, they, they provide with the Taurus missiles, or if the French give them scout missiles that are targeted, or if the Germans give them storm shadows that are targeted. Because understand when I say targeted, Ukraine can't target any of these systems. Everybody, let the Ukrainians fight. Okay. But if you let the Ukrainians fight, they can't use these weapon systems. Why? Because they all are GPS-driven systems. Now, you say, well, Scott, Ukrainians have a GPS downlink capability. Hey, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, but what makes these weapons work isn't just the GPS. It's that they can be 
updated with very precise intelligence information that can only be gathered by the United States and NATO using their satellite reconnaissance capabilities, using aircraft that loiter uh, in the vicinity, using other capabilities. They gather this information and then they're able to build a, a strike package, not just about the target, but what's protecting the target, where the radar envelopes are, where terrain combines with a gap in coverage to create the potential for a drone to navigate its way through without being detected. And remember, because the Russians, like any professional military, are constantly moving their air defense, um, even as you prepare the attack, uh, the satellites are looking for changes and then their updates are being sent again. Now, these updates are being sent along very sensitive communications channels capable of transmitting top secret, what they call special compartmented information, SCI uh, material. When you have TSSCI, um, it's automatically no foreign. That means no foreigner. Um, Ukraine can't touch it. So the Ukrainians can't, they're not sitting there at a satellite downlink waiting for the printout to come out of the American targeting data. The Ukrainians are in another room. The Americans bring in the targeting data. Now we have to load it into the uh, various weapon systems. That's a technical capability that Ukrainians simply don't have. They're not trained to do. So we take the intelligence that we collected based upon a target that we selected, and then we give it to American hands who puts the guidance information into the weapon system. And then and only then does the, the Ukrainian hand come out and push the button. It's an attack by America against Russia. That's literally what's what's happening here. And um, the Russians have, have said that this could lead to nuclear war. But Vladimir Putin, uh, again, I know in America we don't like to talk about this, but hey, guys, thank him because he's the only adult in the room. He's the man who said, um, I'm not going to continue climbing the escalation ladder. I'm looking for a way off. I'm, I'm going to add, at a minimum, add more rungs so that the climb is a little bit longer. We buy a little bit more time. Uh, we're not rushing to nuclear conflict. So he said, look, we understand what you guys are getting ready to do. And we understand who's responsible. Um, but rather than us directly attacking you, you can play at this game. You want to attack us using your weapons uh, through a proxy, Ukraine. Um, we will find third parties around the world who will serve as our proxies, and we will give them long-range precision-guided uh, weaponry that's capable of striking the United States and Europe, or both, if the conflict expands to their territory. So if the United States, for instance, sought to bomb Libya again, maybe this time the Libyans have been equipped with long-range missiles that can be fired and take out sites inside uh, inside. Ukraine and maybe part of the uh, inside Europe, I'm sorry, and maybe part of the deal that Russia is going to cut with these nations is um, a mutual security pact so that these nations, uh, if, if Russia is attacked or, or something happens, uh, are going to be obligated to respond and they will use these long range precision guided munitions to take out sites uh, inside the United Kingdom, inside Europe that, um, you know, otherwise um, would be incapable of being. Uh, attacked, and so, you know, we we what 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 he did is he created this possibility. Then immediately, everybody in the West panicked. My God, the Russians are doing this. Have they done it already? Where would these missiles go? And then Putin came out at the plenary session and said, "We haven't done it yet. Uh, it's something we're considering. But you know, maybe if uh, if the West picks up the phone and calls me uh, and tells me that they're not going to attack us or they're going to back down, maybe we won't do it." You see what he did there? He he bought time. He created additional rungs up the escalation ladder. He is, you know, tried to de-escalate um, the, the, this rush towards war. He's the only adult in the room, as I said earlier, and it's, it's his policies that have um, given me vague hope that we can somehow navigate out of these troubled waters and into, you know, smooth sailing ahead. But it isn't because the Biden administration is avoiding conflict or uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron in France is avoiding it's because Vladimir Putin is avoiding conflict. And Vladimir Putin is doing everything in his power to limit the potential of direct conflict. Um, you know, how long he can do this? Only heaven knows. Um, 
you know, we, we do know that the West continues to view any effort by Russia to avoid confrontation as being a sign of weakness, that somehow Russia, you know, um, is intimidated, they back down, et cetera. That's not the case. Russia is a very strong nation. Um, Russia just doesn't want to commit suicide. They don't want a nuclear conflict. If you look at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, uh, the final plenary session, well, Vladimir Putin didn't start off by talking about the dangers in the world that, that exist. He talked about BRICS, about you know economic issues, Russia's growing economy, Russia's trade with other neighbors, and how Russia will use BRICS to um, cement a coalition of nations that pro will provide the rest of the world an alternative to the G7, group of seven nations headed by the United States that seek to impose their will on them. This is very much the year of Russia, um, uh, but the year of Russia scares the hell out of uh, out of the West. And so, for the moment, you know, the West is leaning aggressively forward, trying to uh, intimidate Russia to somehow convince the Russian people to rise up against Vladimir Putin, to convince Vladimir Putin that there's no chance that Russia can prevail. None of that resonates in Russia. Anybody who's been following Russia understands uh, the importance of what happened in March. Uh, when when Putin won re-election. Um, overwhelming turnout, overwhelming percentage of those who turned out voting in favor. This is a mandate. And then listen to what he said on May 7th in his inauguration, and you see that Putin's taking Russia down a completely new path, one that uh, has everything to do to uh, restoring Russia to its uh, to the status it should enjoy given the size and strength of the of the nation. Uh, but this scares the United States. It's the last thing we want from Russia at this point in time. Thank you for tuning.